back here. And um, so we'll wait until Dennis gives me. Dennis, do we have okay? All right. Well, our next uh, speaker is Rosalind Peterson, who, in my estimation, uh, is the leading expert on the geoengineering. Now, this is a relatively new term. What is geoengineering? Uh, it is a term of engineering the atmosphere. How do you engineer the atmosphere? Well, you will find uh, Rosalind's material fascinating. And of course, she has it all backed up by all sorts of scientific studies. If you haven't got the material that she... Uh, if you haven't got Rosalind's material, oh, why well, you'll certainly want to get it. And uh, Sydney uh, Rosalind, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming today. Um, there may be a voice check here at some point, uh, just in case. But if you can't hear me, if I'm not speaking clearly enough, please let us know. Uh, just raise your hand, I'll call on you, and we'll see if we can have my voice come in loud enough so that you can hear it clearly. Okay, so can everyone hear well? Okay, thank you. A little bit louder? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, can we... They're working on it in the back, so... Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Better. Okay. Can you hear me right now? Bet Is this better? Okay. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the news we hear every day is awful sometimes. And we hear horror stories, scare stories, things that happen every day. And one of the things I'd like all of you to do is relax and smile because you need to take an instant vacation sometime for all of us. And if you can't take an instant vacation from the bad news of the day, you're never going to get through the news of the day. So once in a while, I like to tell people to smile and take an instant vacation because then we can seem to get through things that seem impossible. I have uh, been an activist for many years, and one of the things that I want to tell you is that we can take action to stop things we don't like. And I want to say that the message here, even though I may bring you some news that, doesn't, it, that sounds overwhelming, is that we are all empowered to take action. And so with this message, I want to tell you that this is a positive presentation. And while you're listening to it, you can think about ways to take action, to educate others, to make a positive change not only in your life, but the life of other people and your families and your friends. The issue here, for one, I put a presentation in your packet thanks to Dr. Stan, and I do want to thank him because without his voice, a lot of these issues would not be brought to the forefront, including my own. And Dr. Stan and I have talked about energy efficient light bulbs for many years. And I want to start with them because the EPA and our government agencies all know that the new energy light bulbs contain mercury, mercury vapors, lead, and the older ballasts in your schools, in your homes, in your businesses, are probably leaking PCBs as we speak right now. So one of the things I'd like you to do is take a look at this EPA document. It's not mine, so I'm going to be up front. I copied it straight out of the EPA handbook for how to handle disasters in your home if a mercury light bulb happens to break. It's one of the new ones. The incandescents are being banned. And we're being asked to turn our homes into a hazmat site, which is what happens if one of these bulbs breaks. There are no safe bulbs. You cannot dispose of them in the normal waste stream. It's against the law in the state of California, and you can be fined. If you break one or a firefighter goes into a home with these bulbs, they are exposed to the chemicals from these light bulbs, and it's very dangerous. Most of our government officials, our state, our counties, our cities do not know 
I hope you will take this information and let people know what they have to do if a, if a bulb breaks in your home. This is a critical issue for all of everyone, and no one knows. Dr. Stan and I have been talking about finding a light bulb that might be safe of the new energy efficient, and so far we have not found one that doesn't contain mercury, mercury vapors, and other things. So the action item that I encourage all of you to take is we need to put our incandescents back until we find a safer light bulb, and we need to let our elected officials know that they um, have to provide the hazmat disposal sites. They, we have to, when you even dispose of one, or if you break one, everything, even if you use your vacuum cleaner, becomes a hazmat site, and you have to take it to a disposal waste site that handles hazmat, a lot of times paying for it. You cannot throw the bulbs into a normal trash stream because the mercury will get into your water supplies and your drinking supplies. This is a horror story, but I'm going to tell you, we can all take action. We can say no, and we can take these bulbs down to our elected officials and asking them why they're imposing a light bulbs on us that are turning our homes and our schools into a hazmat site. So I would check your light bulbs. Know that some types of sockets, it'll cause fires if you put them in the wrong types of sockets, like uh, sliding, if you have any uh, uh, sliding uh, uh, lights that slide across the ceilings, they can't go in those. And older homes cannot handle some of the high en energy efficient light bulbs, and they've been causing fires. You're not hearing about this, but the EPA in those documents I gave you is well aware, but the media and no one is talking about this issue. So when I say to you that all of the things that I'm going to talk about here today, you can do something about, you can empower yourself in your homes, in your communities, in your businesses, you can empower yourselves to take action. You don't have to just listen to the bad news, throw up your hands and say, what do I do next? We all have a positive message that we can take, whether we speak out, whether we take action on any of these issues, we can. Because we are the people. We are, as they say, 99%. And so our actions will make a difference for all of you. So the, so the thing I want you to do is to take action in your communities and be positive about things. Pick one issue and go for it. Because we can elect officials. We can vote for people who are going to stand up for what we think is important not issues that they think are important over here that really have nothing to do with what's happening in our lives, at home, with our water, with our skies. So I'm going to tell you just a bit about me. I'm, I was born and raised on a working farm in Mendocino County. I, my whole background was agriculture growing up. I understand crop production. I understand what it takes and the work it takes. I've got a fly here that's <laughs> but anyway, um, I can tell you that what happens is, through the whole process, is agriculture is a lot of hard work. And right now, we are planning some things and doing some things in our skies and in our atmosphere, which is going to have a tremendous impact on agriculture, our food supply. This is right down here with us. This is not somewhere else in another country. This is, in actuality what's happening to us now. My background, I work for the USDA uh, Farm Service Agency in the state of California for many years. I worked for the Mendocino County Agricultural Department. I have also worked um, in the field of agriculture and crop loss adjusting. I was a certified crop loss adjuster for the state. What I did is assessed agricultural crop losses. So whenever there was crop losses in the state of California, they sent us, me and many other adjusters, into those areas to determine why the crops were being lost, what was happening, what the amount of the crop loss was, and to look at um, various practices that may have caused the crop loss by itself. In other words, we had to identify, not only identify, but, but do something with costs. So what I'm going to talk about today is agriculture, I'm going to talk about the weather, I'm going to talk about atmospheric experiments and what's happening that's impacting all of us. In past years, 
We have been a major supplier of agricultural products to the rest of the world. Whenever there was famine and food shortages, we had extra food. Now our agricultural lands are being turned into um, ethanol producers to put into your gas tanks. Major sources of farmland in the form of corn is now going into your gas tank for burning. This land is no longer being used to produce food for all of us, and this is a disaster because this is the breadbasket of the United States. And when you take prime agriculture land and turn it into um, using lots of water and lots of chemicals into producing something that goes into your gas tank, there's something wrong with this picture. And what has happened since we started putting gas um, ethanol from agricultural products in, into our gas tanks, the production of food in the United States has dropped to a point where we have very few supplies of extra food, even to ship to other countries. We also are in a condition now where to meet the food supply demands of the United States, that, what, that means what goes on your plates, that means what goes on your table every day, we are now having to import because we no longer produce enough food in the United States to cover our own needs, and this has been the case for several years now. The data is on the U.S. Department of Agriculture website. My website, the agriculturedefensecoalition.org, was put into place to talk about weather modification and other atmospheric things that we're doing and other policies that we're doing that is going to drop food supply. What I'm going to talk to you today and the facts and some of the things I'm going to bring forward are all on the website. They're not opinions, they're government documents, university studies, government reports, anything and everything that I'm going to try and say here today, I can back up with a government document, a university study, some form of proof that I'm not just talking because I have a belief system going on. I believe we can all make a difference, but I believe that you need to know what's happening. The PowerPoint presentation I know is hard to read today. I put it online for everyone yesterday at, on the geoengineering section of the Agriculture Defense Coalition website. You can go there and you can see the entire PowerPoint presentation. And I made it so that people could use it and give it to um, show for other people because it's somewhat self-explanatory. So I apologize for not being able to have it so that you can see it, which means that I will read a few things for you as I go through different um, parts of this presentation. Geoengineering, called climate remediation, that's the same thing. Climate remediation does not mean that someone's going to do something about your climate and stop droughts and stop floods or do something drastic. Climate remediation means solar radiation management. It means that we're going to put up particles and chemicals like sulfur, sulfur or aluminum oxide, which are to supposedly going up to reduce the amount of direct sunlight reaching the Earth. I'm going to talk about the implications for several things as I go through the presentation, but I want you to know that these words are real that the words that you're going to hear from me are a way to manipulate us into not knowing what the word means and therefore not being able to empower ourselves and take action. So as I go through this presentation, I want all of you to think about what actions you can take. And I'd like you, you can't probably, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, how do you like your skies, your weather, natural or man-made? and some of them you can look up and see. The photograph here shows a sky a picture that was taken over Las Vegas, Nevada. And it's got man-made clouds in it. It's got persistent jet contrails. It's got white haze in it. And that's what our skies are going to look like all the time. If some of these activities that are ongoing are allowed to continue, we will have days in which we don't see direct sunlight at all reaching the Earth and benefiting us. And we're seeing this now in many cases. You're seeing the clouds that you see are not real. They are man-made. And the jets, according to all of everything we know, the jets produce these types of clouds 
And these types of clouds, NASA, the U.S. government, many agencies, Stanford University studies, all talk about as being man-made clouds. In other words, they're not formed by real weather fronts coming in and real, um, in other words, the real climate cycle. So they're man-made. So some of what you're going to see in the skies from now on are man-made, and you will be able to identify and talk of, about them. Um, geoengineering, the U.S. House of Commons, uh, UK Parliament report on geoengineering defines the term geoengineering to describe activities specifically and deliberately designed to affect a change in the global climate with the aim of minimizing or reversing man-made climate change. This was their report on March 10th, and this is in 2010. This was last year. The U.S. House of Representatives Science and Technology Committee met and held hearings in 2009 and 2 in 2010 on geoengineering. It was not broadcast on C-SPAN. It was not broadcast by the media. The media didn't cover this issue, but I certainly was aware of it and started to talk about geoengineering. Right now, the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.K. Parliament are working together. They signed an agreement. The agreement is online, and you can read it. All of these documents are on my website, agreeing that they were going to go forward and work on global geoengineering governance. What I want to say about global geoengineering governance is that they're, not they're talking about doing experiments, putting chemicals, particles, ocean iron fertilization, many, many schemes in order to reduce the amount of direct sunlight reaching the earth or to create in ocean iron fertilization uh, fake algae blooms, which is harmful. They know it's harmful to the oceans. But it would, it, they want to, what they want to do is they say, well, it's going to reduce the carbon di dioxide in the atmosphere. This is absolutely nuts. The impact on the oceans already has been some concern for, from the international standpoint. Right now, I can modify your weather. I can hire a company. I can modify your weather. I can initiate a weather modification program over your city, over your county, over your state. The company I hire will enhance the snow, enhance the rain, dissipate the rain, dissipate the clouds. I can put you in a drought because we have the technology, and it's been with us since the 1940s. The United States has been opening, openly modifying and mitigating the weather since the 1940s. They've had hurricane experiments. The documentation is all online. There's a history, there's many histories of weather modification. So what happens is that we have a military that's modifying the weather. The jets, according to NASA studies, according to NOAA, according to Stanford University, when they produce the man-made clouds, they modify your weather. They change it. They, and so what happens is you may get rain, you may not get rain. They can cloud up your skies, but there's no weather front that came in. A lot of times when your meteorologist and your weather report says, well, there's going to be cloudy skies and there's going to be rain three days from now, we know that the jets are going to come over and cover our skies in man-made clouds. They can even see them, and they can produce rainfall out of them, or not, depending so this is what's going on with the kind of programs that I'm going to be talking about today. But the Earth's atmosphere is being used as a physics laboratory for experiments, multiple experiments without our consent, without our knowledge. Even some of your elected officials don't even know. So some of the information that I'm giving you, they don't know anything about because there's no lobbyist educating them on this topic except to educate them to promote and do more of this type of technology. I don't know if you can see this graphic very well, but it's a geoengineering graphic that was produced in 2001, years ago. And what it talks about is geoengineering is putting aerosols or particles and chemicals in space to reduce sunlight. They want to put giant reflectors in orbit so that it will reflect the sun's rays away from the Earth. Um, they've got cloud seeding. They called genetically engineered crops and trees. 
Uh, they're talking about um, pumping CO2 into the oceans, knowing that they can't sequester it for hundreds of years. It's only a partial fix and it may not work. So some of these proposals are really being discussed. Um, the sunscreen, solar umbrellas, sunshades, space mirrors, solar sails, cloud whitening experiments, ocean iron and lime fertilization, weather modification are all designed to reduce the amount of sunlight uh, that's reaching the earth itself or they're designed because what they want to do is they want to sequester carbon. But no one has told you that water vapor is one of the major greenhouse gases. It rates on the graft much higher than CO2. And they're not talking about that or the impacts of, have, of, of water vapor that's produced by aviation. One of the major impacts that the UK Parliament and other countries are talking about is the impact of aviation because during the combustion of a jet engine, besides jet fuel emissions, one of the things that comes out is water vapor. And they're talking about, Stanford University is talking about in a recent report that water vapor is responsible from aviation for 20 to 30 percent of the warming that's occurring in some areas. Now, when you think about this and you think about the fact that they know how to reduce the amount of water vapor in a combustion engine, we don't have to be living with this problem. However, since the geoengineers have now decided that they want to use a method to put more water vapor into the atmosphere because the, the small particles and chemicals that they're going to put up into the atmosphere that they want to stay up there for some time, if they put it up in the form of very small nano particles, very small sizes, and they have water vapor, they would stay up there much longer. So there's, a, there's talk about putting more water vapor into the atmosphere, but water vapor is a greenhouse gas. So the effect of one is going to offset the effect of the other. So we have to think about these experiments. Okay, the methods of dispersion methods in the skies above us. It's jets, small planes, rockets, drones. And all of these methods have been used in the past, and I went back, I started investigating this subject in 2002, and I had an entire jigsaw puzzle and no information, no documents. So I put my website to work in my mind, and I started investigating, and I found out that these experiments, some of them have been going on since the 1960s, that our atmosphere has been used as an experimental physics laboratory. And the Navy, that's a statement actually from the U.S. Navy uh, saying that that's what they're doing. So what happens is that they put up chemicals, particles, gases, and salt. And one of the experiments is a cloud whitening experiment using salt. So they inject salt into the clouds. And they're talking about one method is to in introduce them with jets. Another method of introducing them is to shoot seawater into the atmosphere to, to get into the clouds. The particles from the salt form water droplets, but they also have a reflective part to them so that this cloud is wider and reflects more sunlight away from us. Here's what the problem is. When salt rains, o rains out over land areas, like all these particles and chemicals, you salt up the soil and you make it in impossible for agriculture production. Your drinking water supplies become salty. This is going to have a tremendous impact on agriculture. When you put up these particles and chemicals, at the hearings that were held by the U.S. House of Representatives, every one of the, the climate scientists or geoengineers all said, and I, and I kid you not, they all said, well, these schemes are risky. The big term is risky. Yes, it could cause acid rains that would impact our trees. Yes, it could pollute the air, the water, the soils. But we must do it to save the earth. Now, what are we saving us from? Okay, let me see if I can explain. Um, water vapor, being a greenhouse gas and man-made clouds, are already trapping heat in the atmosphere. 
In other words, at night, the temperatures may not drop and get as cold. And we need the temperatures at 32 degrees for so many days so that your fruit on an apple tree will set during the winter. If it doesn't go below 32 degrees for so many days, your apple tree is not going to produce much of a crop the following year. This has an impact, any type of warming. warming. Now, we know historically that clouds tend to trap heat. All clouds do. And they trap heat so that the coldness on the ground does not escape through them and get out into the atmosphere and away from the earth. What they're going to do is artificially have these clouds above us so that they're going to trap more and more heat in so that we will actually be warmer because that's what the water vapor and the clouds do and the particles and chemicals. Now, yes, they're going to reflect more sunlight away from the earth. But here's the rub. Everything on Earth depends on photosynthesis, direct sunlight hitting the Earth, for the crops to grow strong. For if you, uh, uh, I'm going to use an example of a corn crop study that was done, done by the University of Illinois. And they did a study and they found that everything else being equal, the soil, uh, the water, everything else being equal, when you had cloud cover, too much of it, corn crop production was reduced. When you had normal sunlight and you had enough sunlight reaching the ground, then it increased crop production. So when we take, we have dying trees because we have a lack of photosynthesis, not delivering up the energy they need to grow strong and healthy. So some of the schemes that they talk about, you have to understand the direct effect on your trees, on agriculture, on acid rains. And this is what is transpiring for all of us. So in talking about it, these, they're called risky because of the pollution, the tree and plant designs, the reduction of photosynthesis, change in soil pH from the chemicals and particles getting into the ground can actually reduce crop production or make it impossible. And we talk about new forms of energy. We talk about solar power, clean energy. We talk a lot about different issues. What happens when we put man-made cloud cover up, as the jets do when they leave persistent contrails and the man-made clouds in our skies for days and days, is that solar power panel production drops. We've done the studies. A man with a solar panel, state-of-the-art solar panel house that's uh, powered entirely by solar. One of the things he found is that his uh, production of electricity dropped 30 to 60 percent, depending on the amount of man-made cloud cover. And, and he was, we were basing it on when the cloud cover um, above this solar panel uh, was man-made versus normal clouds. So you have to understand that if we cover our skies and we reflect direct sunlight away, we are going to reduce cleaner technology, more independent technology from use of oil and other things. So here we are. The other thing about it is that um, in 1990 and since then, the CDC, um, University of California at Berkeley, Kaiser Permanente, a large health organization here in California, and others all came out and said, Ricketts is here. Ricketts is back. Ricketts is a bone disease that is attacking children in the United States. And what it is is that children that don't get enough vitamin D suffer from rickets. And we knew this because when children were forced to work in the coal mines, what happened was they didn't get enough direct sunlight, and so their bones became weak, subject to fractures, bent um, abnormally. And rickets has not been seen in this country since those times. And all of a sudden we have an epidemic of lack of vitamin D, rickets, other problems. Now what happens is your skin acts as a, pardon me, your skin acts as a receptor. So when you go outside, you absorb vitamin D. So not only do your plants absorb vitamin D, but all of you do. I put up a vitamin D section on my website, which links to all of the health problems associated with the lack of vitamin D. 
Now your doctors say, well, you have a lack of vitamin D. You can go down and enrich the pharmaceutical companies and others because you can purchase and buy pills and take pills. But the problem is that if you have, for example, if you're pregnant, you don't get enough vitamin D, they know that your child will be born with an IQ that's a little less than it should be. There's other issues. I tell you this not to scare you, but we need our direct sunlight hitting the earth, and we can make a difference about this. So one of the reasons I'm bringing you to, to this information to you is that when they just talk about geoengineering or climate mitigation, they are talking about interfering with the life process on earth and by deflecting away and putting up man-made clouds extra water vapor all these schemes that they're talking about what is going to happen is we're going to get the water pollution the air pollution we're going to get the tree decline your crop production will drop and what happens is they know that this is happening because when they talk about these schemes being risky that's exactly what the testimony elicited but when the U.S. House Science and Technology Committee, and you can read all of the presentations, it's all online, their reports, everything. When they talk about risky, yes, they admit many of these things. Oh, yes, there's going to be. But we must, we must reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the earth because we must test, we must experiment, and we must have this done on a worldwide basis because once we get going, we can't stop. This isn't a little experiment going to be conducted over Aptos, California to see how it works. This is an experiment on a global scale, and that's why the UK and the US have an agreement to work together on global geoengineering governance. So I look at it from the perspective that this is what's going on. So you talk about increases in health problems being faced today, and people are talking about asthma, eye and skin irritations, raspy throats, pneumonia. They're talking about increases in mold, mildew, flu-like symptoms, solar panel power reduction, reduce, reductions, uh, plant health, backyard gardens. On my email, and I talk to people from all over the United States, one of the major complaints for everyone and from everyone is that their backyard gardens are starting to fail. They don't produce like they used to. People are talking about their trees dying and thinking it's just the trees on their property, but it's the trees all over the United States that are in decline. We depend on our trees because they take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen. They regulate our climates. They help us with our water supplies, and we need them. And these programs are going to take our trees even further away from us. Now, one of the things that I'd like to go into, and um, rocket fuel emissions, jet fuel emissions are all toxic, have impacts, and I put a, a presentation in there. It's also online from an EPA study. So it's not my opinion. This is the EPA documentation. Um, people are talking about memory loss. Did you know that one part of uh, jet fuel emissions interferes with memory? I bet none of you knew this, and it does. And they talk about it in an EPA report that's 40 or 50 pages long. That's one of the conclusions that they made from this report. So not only air pollution, crop damage, and other things. And I can tell you that rocket fuel is just as dangerous. Um, so I'm going to skip um, a little bit here because you won't be able to read some of it, but I'm trying to... Uh, talk the talk, and if you can read it, that's great. Otherwise, it will be online for you to see it at a later time. But I was shocked to find out when I started to investigate that the United States had been engaged in upper atmospheric experiments since the 1960s. 1940s for weather modification programs, but then I found out that they were doing upper atmospheric experiments without our consent, and they were releasing barium, strontium, lithium, calcium, sulfur hexafluoride, and other ion exper ex experiments using the rockets in the space shuttle to deliver the canisters up to conduct their experiments. The, all of these programs are online. You can go to the NASA website and just type in the, the vocabulary, and it'll pop right up. The U.S. Navy has decided that it, it is allowed to put up rockets 
And they did this on the East Coast in 2009. They put up an aluminum oxide dust cloud all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to Maine. They're so proud of it, they even put out a video, which I put up on my website on the, on the Navy section so that you can see it. So when you say, well, we're not doing much, we are. Now, how they got the aluminum oxide up is by rocket. People could see it at night because, they, because, of, the, because of when they did this experiment. Now, the Air Force puts up trimethyl aluminum into canisters with, in conjunction with NASA, and they send these can canisters up, and some of them have barium, some of them have other chemicals, and they send them up on rockets, and they release them, and they superheat them, and they do ionospheric experiments and atmospheric experiments using these chemicals. Now, when all of you say, I've heard a lot of people talk about, well, we're getting aluminum and barium in our air and our water and our soil and tests. Well, the United States government is also conducting these tests using rockets. And what happens is that you can see the spiking after some of their experiments because it comes back down to earth. These chemicals don't stay up. This doesn't stay up in the atmosphere. It comes back down. So what I'd like to say is I listed a few of these, but you can actually go to my website, look up the agency, and read about these experiments. You can read about the University of Alaska talking about how the auroras that we see now, some of them aren't real. They can produce man-made auroras. And I have a picture on my website, and I don't know. I'll get to it in a second. But I have a picture with a man-made aurora up but this is what's going on. And the geoengineers, one of the uh, part, uh, particles that they're talking about putting up is aluminum oxide in order to uh, reflect more sunlight away from the Earth. But the Navy is already putting it up via rockets, and they're putting up a lot of it. So the experiments, when they say they're going to do this in the future, they're fully aware that the experiments are underway. Also... Um, MIT professor Emmanuel, um, Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology, um, on the Discovery Channel suggested putting up a fleet of jets to put carbon black into the atmosphere on the West Coast to influence what was going to be happening with hurricanes on the eastern seaboard of the United States. What he, did, what he failed to say is that when you use a fleet of jets and you release carbon black, it creates weather fronts that will roll off and get more intense as they move across the United States. So everyone is going to feel the effects of some of these experiments that they're talking about. And we see the actual trails in the skies, and we see the carbon black, and I have the actual photographs over on the table on my left, but this is one of the photographs that I took of the black trails. This is not uh, what they might say, oh, it's a shadow. We actually see the end result over time of how these expand and what they do to the actual cloud cover. All of the cloud cover that was taken in this photograph, by the way, was man-made by jets, and we were watching it. And also, um, we watched the jets lay the white trails and then lay the black trails. So what you saw was not a shadow from the sun. It was actually them laying down different types of trails over Ukiah, California. Weather modification programs. Weather modification programs are ongoing. More than 150 weather modification programs in the map in your packet and on the screen shows... Um, the countries that are modifying the weather, changing the weather. The United States modifies the weather in 11 states. We have 69 programs. And the weather modification map we'll have up on the back room there so you can see it. But California, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, Utah, Kansas, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Florida conducts lightning experiments, U.S. complements of the U.S. military. Mexico, the, the country of Mexico modifies the weather, and Alberta, Canada mo modifies the weather. PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, is one of almost 30 different weather modification programs going on in the state of California. Probably didn't know, but I put that information about one of them in Plumas County up on the wall so that you can see it. But these weather modification 
companies use particles. They use chemicals. They use gases. They're land-based. They can use anywhere from the jets leaving the persistent contrails to modify the weather all the way down to small planes, ground-based. And some of it is causing health problems. And in Plumas County, they're beginning to see the health problems from the silver iodide, the silver, nano-silver, and indium and other chemicals that are being used within the program itself. So this weather modification, this photograph that I have right here um, that's also in, on the poster, you can see it, is a 1973 photograph of a hole in stratus cloud deck due to cloud seeding with air, aircraft using dry ice as a seeding agent. And so that I wanted to show that the U.S. military was engaged in these experiments way back when, but they're much more prolific than they used to be. The things that they use, indium, liquid nitrogen, they burn silver chloride, um, propane, using propane gas. They burn silver chloride, bismuth, oxide and potassium chloride, dissolved in acetone. They use sulfur hexafluoride, nanosilver is a possible health hazard, and bariums are noted in many patents and also Professor Gregory Benford of Irvine University talked about using a little bit of a barium and aluminum and making these clouds where they want them, where they want them to move, do what they want them to do. So our whole atmosphere above us is being changed, and it's being changed without your knowledge, your consent. Even your elected officials don't know about it. Um, I've already talked a bit about water vapor, but I'm going to skip here a little bit because I've talked about this in my presentation already. But NASA, NASA studies and university studies show that increasingly persistent jet contrails may turn into man-made clouds that are trapping warmth in, warmth in the atmosphere and exacerbating global warming. NASA goes on to state that any change in global cloud cover may contribute to long-term changes in the Earth's climate. Contrails, especially persistent contrails, represent a human cause increase in the Earth's cloudiness and are likely to be affecting climate and ultimately our natural resources. And the studies are there. So what happens is that even though people just say contrails are, well, that's just uh, water vapor and that's normal, they're nothing like we used to see historically. We used to see blue skies, no trails, no jet trails. And a lot of people said, well, when did you first start seeing them? And in our county, we looked historically back through records, Mendocino County, Lake County, and some others, and the first persisting contrails that we can identify went back to the late 1980s, 1988 to be exact. So the program has been moving forward more and more, and now we can go through entire months without seeing direct sunlight reaching the earth because of the man-made cloud cover and the haze that they produce. Crop production is definitely showing an impact in our counties because of that. So I've got, um, I want to talk to you too, I'm not going to go, I, I've got to skip because I've gone through some of this. Um, I wrote an article on dead and dying trees in 2007, and one of the people that I talked to was Mr. Alan Buckman of the Fish and Game Department, and he talked about the myriad of tree deaths in many, many species, plants and trees, and it was odd because usually it has one species or another that's, that's not impacted. And one of the things that we know from looking at this is that almost every plant, almost every tree has some now decline associated with it. And so what happens is, he said, and I quote, but I have never seen the present condition of widespread decline in almost all species, in all areas, from a wide variety of insects, fungus, molds, mildews, bacteria, and viruses. I have seen areas where every tree and shrub in a drainage area has some form of a health problem. Do you realize that we depend on plants just as our honeybees are in decline? They pollinate most of the food that you see on your table. And they're in decline mostly, I think, because of genetically modified foods and neonicotinoids, which is made by Bayer Crop Science. 
And what happens in this area is they're declining. So our food, our food supply, our trees, everything around us, where what's going to be on your table in the next few years, how much it's going to cost and its availability, are being impacted. And we're beginning to see that some of the atmospheric programs that are ongoing are beginning to have an effect on our crops, on our plants, and our trees. And without them, without direct sunlight coming down from the sun, human health problems, which when I did the list of lack of vitamin D, just human health problems, I was so shocked my jaw dropped. I had no idea on how much we depend upon vitamin D. And you can't take enough pills in enough quantities to ever make up the difference between what you're losing from what we're not getting from direct sunlight reaching the earth. So Alan Buckman summed it up in this article I wrote for me. He said, I think we are in for big changes, and I think we should be on this like a duck on a June bug. I think this is as serious as it gets, and we need to act quickly and document the fact and take corrective action. So I have trees on my website and a lot of government agencies want to blame tree decline on climate change without realizing that we're initiating weather modification programs across the United States. We're conducting atmospheric experiments that are going to cause the decline of our trees, in some cases already are. And the climate change we talk about, in other words, well, we're warming, well, yes, but if we get rid of these man-made clouds from the jets, we're going to cool down because a clear sky allows the heat to radiate away from the earth. And that's what they're not telling you. But they say, well, we're going to fix. It's a chemical fix. It's not a cure, a solution. It's a fix to what we're seeing. Well, I don't want anybody fixing the climate, adding more pollutants and adding more problems for all of us, not for my family, not for your families. So this is what I'm trying to bring to you, is that this is what's going to happen on your dinner table and in your plate unless we take action, it's not like it's going to happen in some other country far away where it isn't going to be here to impact us. And that's why my message to you and why I go and speak. I'm making this presentation available because it's self-explanatory for some of it when you read it. And the documents, 40,000 strong photographs and photograph pictures, um, and these are government documents. These are studies. I try to put them forward so the people have leverage when they go to educate their elected officials. What I can say is that there are lobbyists paid in Washington. They live in Washington. They reside in Washington. They're in the halls of Congress because when I went there, I was accompanied by lobbyists going in and out of offices all the time of the people that you elect. Now these lobbyists are writing the legislation. These lobbyists are lobbying for their causes, whatever. Um, you know, in other words, it doesn't matter. But the American people are not in those offices lobbying. And what lobbyists provide is they say, I want you to support this project, this whatever. And then they give you all the research and all the information, and they educate the staff members at the local level in, in your communities, and they educate the staff members there. So what happens is that if the American people are objecting to it, they say, well, we believe or we think this is happening, and they complain, but we're not lobbying on our own behalf to say, look, we have the evidence here. What are you going to do about this? We're not going down and educating them. We're not electing people at the local, state, and federal levels. We're complaining about what they do, but we're not going in and going and saying, look, if you want my vote, you have to do something about geoengineering. You have to, you, this is not going to pass. You have to speak out. And uh, John Fitzgerald, for example, is here today. He's running for Contra Costa County uh, U.S. Uh, House seat. And one of the things that I decided because I was looking to, on whether or not to support him was that I wanted to know what, where is he going to be on these issues? Does he know about geoengineering? Does he know about these atmospheric programs? Does he know about the weather modification and the tree decline? He came to my house, actually. And what happened was, because he wanted to know, he took a tree, to, he took a tree tour in Mendocino County with 
with me. And when he looked at the tree decline and the dying of the trees and saw the, the photographs of them and saw them in person when we walked around the property and other areas, when he saw that, he said, look, he said, we have to do something about this. I get it. I get it that it isn't just my tree at my house. It's all over. So when you go to uh, Mendocino County, for example, you go up on, uh, go to uh, Little River, for example, or you go to Mendocino, for example, on, on Highway 1, and you drive by, you're going to see massive tree declines. You're going to see the Doug fir dying. They're standing trees. They're a fire hazard. They're dying all over the place. You're going to see the oaks, and not oaks with sudden oak death syndrome. You're going to see the pines that no longer have the strength to grow straight up toward the sun. But what they're doing is they, get, they start growing, and then when they get about 15, 20 feet high, they just bend over, and they're starting to lean on the trees next to them because they don't have enough energy to grow straight and tall and strong like we know them. It is the redwood trees that are in decline. Our beautiful redwood trees, the bark on redwood trees, you've all seen the pictures, you've seen them in person, the beautiful bark on the redwood trees, it's so beautiful, it's called redwood because it's the most gorgeous tree and the most gorgeous bark. And when you see the painters and the the, the photographs of them and you see them in person, they're stunning. And yet now what we see is a white green mold on them, on the tree trunks. We see that they're dying from the top down in many cases. And they say, we don't know why. And we say, well, test the soil. Aluminum is in the soil. Could that be impacting them? We say, look, you're having man-made clouds. They're not getting the rainfall that they used to and the fogs that they used to. We're changing the climate. And they say, well, you know, it's just climate change. As if climate change meant... Climate change is not a word that we can't do something about. We can do something about climate change because we are modifying the weather. We're running weather modification programs all over the place. We're atmospherically making man-made clouds that impact the weather, our trees, the climate. So this is the story that I bring to you. It's a positive story. It's a story that when we take action, we can make a difference. Um, my mother um, and my father fought having a nuclear power plant right off here on Point Arena. One of the ra- ma- movers and shakers in Mendocino County that said, no, we don't want a nuclear power plant here. And the nuclear industry was saying, oh, well, we're going to make it into a park where people can go and visit and grow tr- plants and trees. Some illusion that your property values would go up if you live next to a plant. So my mother said no, stood up to power. I have stood up to the end, and people ask me, well, are you afraid to stand up? And what I say is, no, I'm not afraid. I took, uh, we, a group of us um, in many states have taken on the U.S. Navy, who intends to decimate 11.7 million marine mammals in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and right off here in your coast, the Navy is conducting warfare testing. And Congressman Mike Thompson in our district in Northern California and other and, and um, senators in other areas, uh, there's a letter in your packet which designates this information, but they won't stop the sonar and the bomb blasts and the electromagnetic weapons testing, even during the migrations of the blue whales and the gray whales and all the other animals. And when they talk about they're going to take 11... 0.7 million marine mammals, it means that they're going to decimate them. And Barbara Boxer and Senator Feinstein did not hold public hearings on this issue. And the reason that they didn't is because they're going to sacrifice. They didn't even get a stop to the migration patterns for the salmon, nothing. So what happens is right off your coast, from Southern California, there's the Southern California Northwest Training Range. There's the Northern California Training Range, which goes all the way from Northern California all the way up to Washington. And they're conducting Navy warfare. They're going to conduct a five-year program in the Gulf of Mexico. I have stood up to the Navy. I have spoken out. I have talked to their personnel. No one has ever harassed me. And we have delayed, fought. We're in another battle um, to stop it before the 12th of November. But here's the issue. 
No one has come to get me or bug my phone. They know who I am because they can go to my website and find out who I am. But I'm going to tell you, you can stand up to powerful agencies. You can get your elected officials engaged, and Congressman Thompson has been engaged on this issue to try to get them to protect the biologically sensitive areas for the fish we eat and other areas to protect the jobs of the, uh, to protect, um, jobs of the fishermen, um, essentially. So it's economic as well. So when we talk about all of these things, the dying of the trees, we talk about what's going on, all of these things, I'm going to skip a little bit because I've gone over some of this already. Um, the state of California water testing reveals lots of toxic chemicals in your drinking water. The information is free from your local water agency. They can tell you what the chemicals are. They're required to under the California Public Records Act at just barely the cost of copying. And they can also, you can also find out what's in every single public drinking water source. There's a document, um, an agency at the state of California, it's the State Department of Health Drinking Water Division, and they're the repository, and it's online, of every single drinking water test taken in the state of California going back to the 1970s. All this information is available to you at your local level. It's available, but they don't want you to know what's going on. So I've listed some of the chemicals um, that we're finding, aluminum, strontium, beryllium, barium, iron, manganese. Um, there's a whole lot of things. The honeybee decline um, is going on, and we need to speak out on that issue about the neonicotinoids, which the uh, Bayer Crop Science, which brings you Bayer aspirin, has also said um, can affect honeybee larva when the honeybee brings it, when uh, the honeybee brings the pollen back uh, to the um, uh, to the hive. The pollen from the sprayed plant is infected with these neonicotinoids that are sprayed on the crops. So many honeybee producers won't take their honeybees into areas where there's uh, GM crops or where there is uh, some chemicals are sprayed because they know that their hives will be impacted. But we have to make this an issue because otherwise every spice, you like coffee? Honeybees pollinated it or other, other, other things. Flowers were pollinated by other things. So all of this is important. So what you want to do is you want to go and say, how do you like your skies, natural or man-made? Do you want to be sprayed? Do you want to have releases over you like you were a bug? I mean, this is your choice. And we can say no. But we have to say no with the facts. We can't just say, well, I believe this is happening. We have to say it. We have to take the documents, take the information, and deliver it up. And the message I have for all of you is when the news is bad, take action. Get rid of those, you know, in other words, take action in your home. But remember, if you protect just your home, the food supply is out there where we live on an agricultural land. The water comes from somewhere else. So if you only protect your niche, you don't protect enough, in other words, because everything that you have is going to come in. The air you breathe is going to come from some test where some person is going to say, oh, we're going to conduct a uh, test and we're going to put sulfur into the atmosphere. Sulfur was taken out of, ga uh, out of diesel gas in California by law. Why? Because of asthma and health effects. Now you have geoengineers who are telling the U.S. Congress that they want to step up to the plate and they want to put this back in our atmosphere again. Why would they take it out of diesel fuel because it's a problem and then put it back up into our skies to reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the earth? There's something wrong with the picture for all of you. And so I'm just going to say we can take action today. Hold on one second because I'm just about done and then I'm going to, I have two things left to do. You can take action. The other thing that you can do is to understand that action taking can take all forms, but no action is acquiescing. You're going to say, yes, I'm the guinea pig, and when you take no action. So a group by the name of the Bipartisan Policy Center, made up of former senators, uh, Republicans and Democrats, has now decided that climate remediation is the new word. They want to replace geoengineering with climate remediation because they can sell it to you more easily. 
their webcast on this issue, talking about risky geoengineering programs and how we must do it, even though we know it's risky, we must do these experiments, is online. And they're online as saying, for all of you to say, we're going to go to Washington as lobbyists and we're going to tell the Obama administration and those in power that this is what they must initiate and we're going to teach them the new terminology. But in the webcast, it talks about all of you and says, well, we're only going to tell them what they need to know because you're subpar in, in being able to think and understand it. So we're going to market it and merchandise it and use climate remediation because you'll think it's going to help the climate. You're not going to realize that this is going to be detrimental to all of us. So now, in, um, there's going to be, we're going to all be here to talk about this and answer questions. But I want Alan Buckman, um, he's a friend of mine. He's um, of the fishing game. He's a biologist for... 30 years, over 30 years. And he's going to come up, and what he's going to do is he's going to talk about what he's seeing on the ground because of his bio, his background in biology. And also, he was in the U.S. Air Force and has a background in weather as well. He's going to speak for just a few minutes, and then what we're going to do is um, I will be back and uh, we'll, we'll talk about these issues and there will be a panel later today. We're going to make all this information, whatever you need, available. So with that, I'm going to let Alan Buckman come up. Okay. Huh? Um, end of slideshow. It says click to exit, and then you can put yours. Let's do. Here, wait a minute. Uh, where's my? You should be able to click. Okay, let's go. Where's mine? Is this it here? Man, man. They just won't be able to see it very well. I know. Where a slide? Oh, here it is, slideshow. I can't see. It should be. I got it. Here, wait a minute. Okay. The clock's right there. We'll run a little over. Ladies and gentlemen. Talk into this one. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Don't move these around. Well, here. Okay. Right. Talk, into, talk into this one, right? Oh. Both, but... This one right here directly. How is that? Can you all hear me? Yes. Hopefully. Um, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's a really pl a pleasure for me to be here um, and to see so many people who are interested in these programs and wanting to learn more. Um, the title, what I'm talking about, I'm just going to call it Man-Made Climate Change in the Skies, and this is part of a presentation that, that I did uh, at the Commonwealth Club in uh, in March, um, I was a weather or a biologist with the Department of Fish and Game actually for 38 years, and during that time, my field work, uh, I started noticing a lot of plant death and die off everywhere I was going, and it was getting progressively worse. I was really concerned about what's going on. I'm I'm on the ground looking at all of this and wondering what's happening. Well, about that time, uh, the sudden oak death hit, hit California, uh, at least central California, and uh, that was, uh, you know, the big problem. But as I traveled around, I found out, well, uh, SOD is just one of the pathogens that's around, and there are a lot of them. Uh, there were similar problems going on with all of the habitats I was looking at, and it had a lot more to do than just SOD, which got me really curious. Uh, sudden oak death, excuse me, uh, Phytophthora remorums. Uh, yeah, call me on these. I have a tendency of being a, a government scientist to use a lot of acronyms and words that maybe everybody isn't familiar with. So forgive me for that. I do. Uh, th thank you very much. <laughs> As I was looking around, the tree death that I was observing all tend to follow the same kind of patterns. It actually all looks like solar burning or freezing. Uh, we start losing the, the tips of the trees. Uh, the branches uh, uh, get thin. You, you lose your canopy. I 
unfortunately, I don't know if you can see these very well. Um, anyway, the, the canopies get thin. The tips of the branches do what they call lion tailing. They'll get a clump of, of, of vegetation out on the end, and they'll be bare in the rest of it. Um, and it's it's a progressive thing. Now, the upper right-hand corner of this picture basically shows the, the collapse of a whole oak grove. Uh, and this is outside of the SOD area. And, this, and uh, again, but it's exactly the same thing going in to, on inside the sudden oak death area. Um, is that some of the trees are already dead. Most of them are losing their foliage. Um, it hasn't been until just recently when we got these last rains that things have been actually perking up around this area. So things change a little bit, but uh, the reason for that is that things are shifting, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I got very concerned with the changes in the plant communities because all our wildlife and our ecosystems are all, all balanced on a normal kind of weather chaos uh, in that when weather patterns flow in, the mountain ranges and the moisture and all the rest of it have certain patterns that they've developed over, over, the, over time. And the plants and animals all evolve to those changes. So the habitats and the environment they're in are really sensitive to these changes. If you change them too fast, you lose species. And if they can't adapt, we're in big trouble. Um, the Lower right-hand corner of this picture basically shows along the coast Fort Bragg area. Uh, they're uh, white fur. Everything facing the wind and the sun is toasted. Uh, the, the, the forests, all the state forests along the coast have been cutting thousands of trees. As they're dying off, they don't want it to look bad, so they're cutting trees. Um, Uh, this is a, well, again, I wish I had a little bit better clarity on these pictures. Um, uh, the laurel and, and eucalyptus are both carriers, tend to be carriers of the sudden oak death uh, pathogen. And they cause cankers and, and tip death. And it evolves, we found it on redwood, uh, found it on chaparral. In uh, fact, I think last I knew there were over 80 species that are, are being affected by this. Uh, and again, other fungus, well, I took a lot of samples, when I, and when I took them in, all the labs would tell me was, well, it's, it's uh, either bugs or, uh, or fungus. Okay, uh, yeah, that's what's on them now, but what caused the bug and fungus invasions? You know, it has been classic that when you start having a, a, an invasion of species, it's because the, the trees are weak. Things are changing. They're stressed. And when you're talking about a stressed environment, you're talking then about uh, a really rapid spread of these conditions. As I traveled, uh, I go to Illinois quite often, uh, went, to, went to Arkansas for a training, um, and New York. Uh, when Marazan and I both went to make a presentation to the United Nations on these subjects in 2007. Um, and in Canada, uh, went all through the Laurentians, beautiful area, but the problems are the same everywhere. Uh, I saw exactly the same kind of tree death. They're cutting down the trees the same way they're doing in California. To, it looks like, well, you, you want to take the dead wood out of the forest because of forest fire problems, generally. But a lot of it is for looks, too. And then it's also, gee, we have more wood available right now. And, and there are some uh, aspects of that. But all of those areas reported when I investigated that, they all said, oh, it's, it's fungus or it's insects. Okay, different fungus, different insects. Same problems. Um, then I read, um, I can't even read my own stuff here, uh, Charles E. Little's In the Dying of the Trees. And what he said was, from the cedars of Alaska to the palms of Florida, from the maples of Canada and New England to the pines and incense cedar of the Sierra Nevada, the incidents of death and decline are increasing at an alarming rate. Uh, further, uh, another study from the uh, USGS biologist or, uh, was the tree death in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California has doubled since 1983. 
Stress and dieback have occurred from Alaska to Mexico. Since 1997, more than 20 million hectares or 50 million acres have been affected. And it's more, uh, this was in 2009, and I haven't updated the numbers, and I'm sure it's much bigger than that now. Um, also in this picture, I, I really wish you could see it, because the picture was taken at about, from an aircraft at about 35,000 feet. And what I could see out the window uh, were other uh, jet-formed clouds and a haze that went all the way to the ground. So haze is a really important part of this project. They're not only creating clouds, they're creating haze. I'll, I'll go into how those work together and what other technologies they're using because this is a, the, the cloud spraying program is only one part of a, a system. As I traveled in Canada, uh, the other thing that's going on worldwide is, is water pollution. <laughs> Uh, increases in blue-green algaes, it's okay, increases in blue-green algaes particularly, and most of the blue-green algaes produce neurotoxins uh, as well as, as terrible odor. Um, in Canada, what it's doing, this sign, basically, they've closed off thousands of lakes, and people living around lakes uh, have had a lot of problems with health, health problems, mostly neurological diseases. Well, what this has done is that our water supplies are in jeopardy. There's an increase in disease. There's a loss of recreational use. Uh, there are a lot of dead trees. And uh, I said chemtrail skies here, but I'm, I'm going to get into that term here in a minute so, uh, uh, so that you understand where I'm coming from that comment. Um, also, I have a company that we've been using natural biological products to treat water. And we treated uh, a pond for the California Department of Fish and Game. It's the West Novato Pond. It was, uh, it had, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. It had over 300 parts per million of, of hydrogen sulfide, sulfur compounds, and again, neurotoxins. When the neurological societies started looking at where are, somebody finally asked the question, well, is it all of these neurological problems, are they somehow related to some particular system? And when they, somebody actually mapped out on a map where the, most of these problems were occurring, and they found out that most of them were close to water. Almost were, all of them were near big lakes, uh, ponds, and other kinds of water situations. Well, we treated this pond, and then we knocked the odor out of it in one day. Um, the species with that we were treating was, uh, I never can remember the name of this guy, oh, Anabena spiroides. It's only one of the blue-green algae. And its levels were over 300 parts per million in the pond, uh, which is incredible. We, in, in five months uh, after treatment, uh, there, we couldn't even find the Anabena. Um, the, at the beginning, there were no fish. There was very little vegetation in the pond, and at the end, and at two years, we had um, a fish population back in and aquatic emergent vegetation hurt, happening again. So we actually recovered the pond. Um, in talking about chemtrails as a t as a word, um, it was in 2002 that that Rosalind and I got together, and she handed me a video. She knew I was a wildlife biologist, and that I'd been a weather observer in the United States Air Force. And so she handed me this video, and it was made by a fellow uh, named Cox. It was out of England, but they filmed it over the Bay Area. And the title on the thing had to do with chemtrails. Well, I thought, well, I'd never even heard of chemtrails before, uh, and. Um, I knew they were, anyway, when I looked at the video, it didn't take me very long to figure out that this was a created sky condition. These were not, uh, they were not normal contrails. In, in historically, contrails have very short, short life, uh, leave a small trail, disappear, and uh, that's not the case today. Well, it is partially the case because there are still aircraft going over these areas that aren't leaving any kind of trail. 
and, and they say, well, they're at different elevations. You can go to almost ele every elevation and find out there are planes flying through that are not leaving these trails. Um, so anyway, then I started, uh, I started looking, I got my telescope out and started looking at the aircraft. What I found out was that the aircraft were mostly white, unmarked, either KC-135, which is a Boeing 707 refueling tanker, um, or C-141s, which is our, our huge strato tankers. And they, I found them flying in military airspace, which means they were either military or military contractors. They're flying in grid patterns, and they're getting really good coverage. They do turnarounds. Um, you'd see four to six working an area at a time. Um, and there, there's various nuclei. When they're laying out the clouds and you start looking at the cloud patterns, you find out that in, in a lot of cases, almost every line had different kind of cirrus in it. And you'll never see that in a normal front, ever. Okay, so these aren't part of normal, any kind of normal weather pattern. You can spray nuclei in into a weather area and the natural conditions will pick up and make the kind, generally make the kinds of clouds, but it, the way it spreads out depends on the nuclei they use. I know in the Air Force we used, uh, um, excuse me, we used silver iodide. And as I started looking at the clouds, I went, boy, they've gone a long way since I was in the Air Force. I got out in 64. So it's, it's been some time. But anyway, we, de we never had that kind of technology then. Um, they do turnarounds, which our commercial jets don't do. And I've just, I actually photographed three different turnarounds here in the state. Um, then it came down to the term contrails versus chemtrails. You know, and contrails by definition, they don't form clouds. Now, there was a recent thing that came out that basically showed the, the war when we, all our B-25s and, and uh, aircraft were in World War II. Uh, the exhaust in the, in the prop engines had a whole lot of other kinds of nuclei, and yes, they did leave sky cover. And they'd cover the entire sky with it. Uh, but as we improved our fuels and, and with the jets flying, they were actually trying, I think, for a long time to reduce the amount of, of material coming out of the engines. Um, anyway, you can see both of them at, at the same time now. And it was very clear to me that there was a, a, a creation program going on uh, that had a lot of ramifications. And I thought... It has all of the potential to be causing most of the environmental problems I'm seeing in the trees, uh, both from the particulates falling out of them and from the changes in the weather. Now, Rosalind went over the, the loss in solar illumination, which is really important. Um, but there are, are other, uh, well, there are other conditions and things that are happening. Now, NASA, again, I, I think Rosalind had the same uh, quote in 2005, we're talking about persistent jet contrails. To me, that was a misnomer because contrails, that was not the definition of contrails. And so it seemed to me, well, if it's not the definition of contrails, chemtrails seemed like a really good term. And I found out that I could even talk about artificial cloud creation and a program going on, and I'm just as big a conspiracist if I say chemtrails. So I figured it doesn't matter what I call them. We all know what we're talking about. And just to relate to the information, they're basically the same thing. Anyway, NASA changed the definition of contrails doing that. Um, the terms chemtrails, I put on here HARP, but actually it was electromagnetic weapons or electromagnetic, electromagnetic or scalar technologies. Both of those terms came up in the military weapons programs as being associated and weather modifiers. And I thought, well, that's really very interesting. Uh, and how are we doing all of this? Well, the elephant in the sky uh, is the cloud and haze program. I found it is haze, too. Uh, and the U.S. Air Force, and this is documented also, came out saying, well, we're going to own the weather by 2025. Well, how would you own the weather? You have to be changing it. As Rosalind pointed out, we've been doing this for a long time. We've been changing the weather. I'm not sure you could call these tests. You, can, you know, I got a 20-year test going. You know, I got a 30-year test going. Right. Uh, not exhaust. Here's just a picture of one of the planes. 
has the U, uh, USAF insignia or the USA insignia on it, but these are not coming out of the jets, out of the engines. And these aren't coming out of the engines either, if you can see that. There are like 10 trails coming out of this aircraft. It's not exhaust, and uh, it's not a contrail. Uh, again, unnatural clouds and sky cover. Uh, I was told that, that one of the, the compounds, boron, uh, makes the fluffy clouds. I've heard several different elements that are different elements can cause the same kind of condition, uh, which means they're basically using, and looking at the, at the clouds, they're basically using a lot of different water-loving salts and compounds uh, that attract water vapor, and if they're coming, mixing it with the exhaust, which they do, they're getting some water vapor right out of the exhaust. So the two of them working together create these really interesting sky conditions, but they're not good for us. And then some of them, I have no idea what they're bursting in these. Uh, I, not being able to fly up and grab a sample and see what exactly is going on, but you'll see bursts, you'll see core tracks, you'll see filaments, you'll see all sorts of strange things mixed in with these, in these clouds that aren't normal. I, I can't tell you what they are, uh, we know basically from the, the rainfall and, and what's going on with our drinking water supplies what the elements appear to be uh, because they appear all over at the same time and the only way you could make an application like that is aerially. So what are they spraying? Well, the USAF, in fact, they brag about it on, or did brag about it on their website uh, is that they use chaff and chaff uh, is basically aluminum coated fiberglass. And they started out using great big strips of this stuff and uh, found out, well, it had some effect. They've, they've actually gone nano with this. And for them to spray it at 35 or 40,000 feet and have the cloud stay in the sky, the size of those particles has to be less than 7 microns, which is it was nano size, uh, which keeps them in suspension a long time, and it takes a long time for them to drift down. And the thing they said was, well, it has high electrical conductance and 10 times the reflectivity of sulfur. So if you were going to reflect sunlight, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how far, uh, how, how fast this had gone. Um, anyway, it was in 1987, the California drinking water contamination, it, it appeared in all of the drinking water in all of the states, in the states, and that was out of the data that, that the... Uh, the uh, California water records provided. Um, I want to hit these two things. And this was uh, really alarming Mount Shasta data. This was a snow test. The normal for aluminum is uh, 0.5 micrograms per liter. The maximum in drinking water is 50 micrograms per liter. The snow on Mount Shasta was 61,000 micro micrograms per liter. Federal action is supposed to occur at 1,000 micrograms per liter, and none was taken. Why? Why? Okay, big questions. Barium came out at, at 1 microgram per liter, which is very high for barium. Then this, this is the other thing that's really affecting the plants and the species that got me really concerned. Well, it all does. But the forest soil pH in the, whole, in the Shasta area historically was 5.5. It's now 6.8. That's a 10 times more alkaline condition than normal. Do you think trees have a hard time and the plants have a hard time growing when they get a change like that in their soil pH? Um, they won't. The other thing was stream insects. And 20 years ago, it was pretty common to get about a thousand uh, bugs per sample or aquatic insects, and now it's less than 30 in most sites. So uh, we've had severe vegetation and wildlife impacts. We've had severe aquatic and ecosystem impacts. And uh, on that, I had some other things, but uh, considering the time left, uh, I'm going to let Rosalind finish up with what she had to say. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to be brief. Alan Buckman and I will be here all day today. We will answer any of your questions. And one of the things I want to say again is that Dr. Stan Monteith is so exceptional in allowing a voice and allowing different items of information to come out. 
And I think that we need to give him a standing ovation because he is allowing so many voices to be heard on these various topics. And so, Dr. Stan, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we really need a standing ovation for Rosalind. That was a beautiful presentation, as was the uh, presentation by the biologist. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, we're going to uh, have a grace, then we'll break for lunch. I ask you, um, you can go back for seconds or thirds, but just use one plate, because they determine how many lunches they're going to build us for by the number of plates that they use. So we'll just do that. We will start again at 1 o'clock. We will have uh, two one-and-a-half-hour talks, a couple of breaks in the middle. And then we're going to can, uh, do something a little different. We're going to end with a panel. We'll have a panel for about an hour at the end, and you can ask your questions there. Uh, you're welcome to talk to the speakers in the meantime. But we do want the panel because there's so many other issues that really need to be brought up. Uh, but we are living, as you can see, in the most amazing times. I mean, how could these things be going on? I mean, I've noticed the trees are dying, but most people, uh, they pass right by them, completely oblivious of what's going on. After all, the important things is the, the World Series coming up. Uh, we, we hope that the uh, National Basketball Association contracts will be signed so we can begin the basketball season. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are basically involved in a struggle for our lives. So if you uh, stand, join me, and um, we'll have a grace, and then we will go ahead. And, uh, and this is a good lunch. You go back for seconds and thirds. Just don't take a second or third plate. <laughs> our Heavenly Father, we uh, ask you, of course, to bless our speakers for this morning and for this afternoon. We ask you to utilize the food we're about to take, that we may strengthen our bodies, we may be of more service to you. Be with the speakers. They put a lot of time and effort into this. And um, God bless you. Thank you so very much for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, uh, and I, I would mention that Dennis Whipple has some videos that he uh, has over there in the corner if you want to buy any of those. Um, Why, well, these are things that Dennis Whipple has done before, and we certainly uh, uh, ask you to stop by his table. Hi, Mark. Uh, billionaires behind the UN understand the bioengine is detrimental to them too. Uh, well, some of them don't care. They don't care. They're killing them. 